ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ದೊರೆಸ್ವಾಮಿ ದಿ ಆನರಬಲ್ ಚಾನ್ಸಲರ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಯೂನಿವರ್ಸಿಟಿ ಅಬೌಟ್ ವಿಚ್ ಐ ಹ್ಯಾಡ್ ಹರ್ಡ್ ಬಟ್ ದಿಸ್ ಈಸ್ ದ ಫಸ್ಟ್ ಟೈಮ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಎಕ್ಸ್ಪೀರಿಯನ್ಸಿಂಗ್ ದ ಮೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಇನ್ಸ್ಟಿಟ್ಯೂಷನ್ ಪ್ರೊಫೆಸರ್ ಜವಾಹರ್ ದೊರೆಸ್ವಾಮಿ ಹೂಸ್ ಇನ್ಸಿಸ್ಟೆನ್ಸ್ ಆಸ್ ಆ್ಯಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಬ್ರಾಟ್ ಮೀ ಹಿಯರ್ ಐ ವಾಸ್ ಟ್ರೈಂಗ್ ಟು ಎಸ್ಕೇಪ್ ಬಿಕಾಸ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೋ ಮಚ್ ಆಫ್ ಥಿಂಗ್ಸ್ ಟು ಡೂ ಲೆಕ್ಚರಿಂಗ್ ಈಸ್ ಸಮಥಿಂಗ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಐ ಆಮ್ ಲೂಸಿಂಗ್ ಇಂಟ್ರೆಸ್ಟ್ ಸೊ ಟು ಮೇಕ್ ಮೀ ಲೆಕ್ಚರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಟು ಅನ್ ಆಡಿಯನ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ದಿಸ್ ಕೈಂಡ್ ಇನ್ ವಿಚ್ ಗ್ರೇಟ್ ಪೀಪಲ್ ಲೈಕ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಜೈಶಂಕರ್ ಈಸ್ ಸಿಟಿಂಗ್ ಇಟ್ ಈಸ್ ಅ ವೆರಿ ಬಿಗ್ ರೆಸ್ಪಾನ್ಸಿಬಿಲಿಟಿ and dr sanjeev sanyal of course he had very concrete things to say but i may have very abstract things to tell you so you may have to suffer every different kind of uh, speaking and sachin malhan who is going to talk on uh, the innovators talk and uh, professor ajay kumar and doshi jay kumar who are the distinguished alumni who will be speaking here in fact i wanted to open with uh, the kind of world order that is emerging but in the presence of dr jay shankar it will be very presumptive of me to talk about where the world is going and what will be the position of india in that of course he is the right person to talk about it but still as a student of uh, foreign policy and geopolitics and strategic uh, school of thought i thought i would share some of the thoughts which uh, is not current in the public discourse which is not very much prevalent in even academics it has to have a historical uh, uh, recalling see the world has been running in the last they say 50 years or 60 years or 70 years actually the world has been running for the last 200 years on the western paradigm what the west is and what india is is a comparison which very few people have attempted to do except at very high levels like uh, great people like mahatma gandhi and arabindo who were great critics of the western civilization in fact mahatma gandhi went as far as to say it is an evil arabindo even said that india will rise only on the ruins of the west you can understand these are on very ordinary minds they are very serious people and they could see far ahead and they could see from a helicopter perspective as to where the entire human race is leading to and when they use these very strong words that made me think very deeply about what is the position of india not now 50 years back 40 years back when india was nobody then nobody even would look at india even indians did not look at india why talk about others when this is the position we began thinking about how to rebuild india the indian mind how to rebuild its confidence when i went to london in 1986 on an invitation by one of the top industrialists there for this consultation when i handed over the passport when i was to about to pass the uh, immigration the immigration officer asked why have you come here for i said i have come because uh, every top industrialist has invited me here is the letter i am a very well known consultant in india and uh, when are you going back i said why i have come here tomorrow evening i am going back he said what is the evidence that you will go back i had a return ticket business class ticket of uh, british airways i showed it to him you know no, your people come with these tickets and they stay here and they don't go back i was shocked i told them i am not entering your country you please prepon the ticket and give it to me i am going back then he was shocked i really meant it because when you face that humiliation either you accept it or rebel against it the indians did not have the mind to rebel against humiliation he is one of the reasons why india declined and a declining india operated in a world order which was led by the west and it is not the physical order it is not the military order it is not the geopolitical order it is the psychic order that is what mahatma gandhi and arabindo protested against and now the reverse is happening the west led world order 
is weakening. Many people say it is shaking up. Some great minds who formed the order, like uh, Kissinger, is saying it is getting permanently restructured. And a person who feels that West-led world order is a must for the West to survive, like uh, George Soros, he says that the West-led order may collapse. The Western civilization may collapse. That means for the Western civilization to survive, the West class world order is a must and it must sustain and it must keep going and it must be imposed on others, whatever is the model for that we have to do. This is the world in which we are now entering. I see four distinct, of course, Mr. Jay Shankar is the best person to talk about it. But anyhow, as I said, as a student, I can always err in front of him. So the West led post World War order or the post Cold War order is in ICU today. It doesn't know where it is actually. Second thing is there is no alternative to it in sight. There is utter confusion everywhere. The third thing is there is a great diffusion of powers taking place. The middle powers are rising. Of course, this always happens when the top world power or the top person in any system gets weakened, then different people begin to uh, uh, share the space. And there is absolutely no doubt that the world is entering a phase where there will be no hegemonic power. I mean, all that I am saying is based on some research by some institution, including the, uh, including the European Union's uh, researchers, that you are entering into a very highly uncertain world, uncertain waters. So one thing is certain, the present cannot extend it to future. When we talk about the past, present and future, the present cannot extend into the future is very much uh, in front of us. I would like to make my presentation on four principles. One is, we must empty our mind and begin thinking afresh because when great changes are taking place, when present is not going to extend into the future, we cannot be thinking about the current assumptions, the current way of thinking, the current way of doing things, and we have to empty our mind. In fact, this happened in the life of Maharishi Aurobindo. When he had come from uh, Calcutta, the revolutionary movement had collapsed. And everybody was looking at Maharishi Aurobindo, that such a great thinker, great man, he is going to show us the way. But Aurobindo was looking at a mystic called Kulachwami, about whom Subramanya Bharati has written poems. And he said, it is this madman who is going to show me the way. And that madman will laugh, he will throw stones, he will cry. They said, what has happened to Aurobindo? One day, Aravindo was sitting and having a cup of tea along with his friends. And Kulachami came and lifted the tea cup in the front of Aravindo and showed it was full. Then he emptied it and showed it, dropped the tea, emptied, the empty tea cup was shown. Aravindo said, I have got my lesson. <laughs> his friends asked, you have lost your tea, please tell us what lesson you got. Aravindo said, he has asked me to empty my mind and begin thinking afresh. That is what made Aravindo what we know him to be. You know, it is very important for us to empty our mind and begin thinking afresh. It is not that what has been dropped is useless, but what has held us so far in a frame of mind is not going to extend into the future. The second thing is, the most obvious things, the most obvious truth is so abstract, it is most difficult to detect. This happened in the life of uh, uh, Newton that uh, apples were falling, everybody thought apples will only fall. He only asked why it didn't go up. So the obvious things actually mesmerize you into believing that is the truth. But there is a truth behind that. So we must understand that there are Newtonian falling apple facts, which is very important for us to guide India into, the, into its own future and to the future of the world, I will mention three distinct facts as I conclude my speech. The third is that take an integrated helicopter view. We are so over-specialized today. 
in fact one of my friends went to uh, an eye specialist uh, with his wife with a complaint he said there are eight different fields of specialization sir at the get i can understand if somebody says you know you need to go to a specialist so we are so specialized we have lost the idea of what everything looks alike it is like of course the old saying goes how do we identify an elephant that is how we are now trying to identify the entire idea of life broken down into such minute specializations no one has any idea as someone who has experienced the uh, economic thinkers i mean i am not an economist in fact i uh, what i am i don't know myself the journalist think that i am a chartered accountant the chartered accountant think i am a journalist and when somebody called me an economist dr jagdish bhagwati said if you call him an economist you can call me a bharatanatyam dancer so this is the kind of uh, uh, lack of uh, the confusion in uh, my identity so when uh, um, sanjeev sanyal a trained economist and he is the uh, advisor in the prime minister's economic council when he talks i have very serious problems with him because i don't agree with that economics because that economics that idea i am not talking about him i am talking about the field in which economists operate in fact in 2008 after the economic crisis the economist magazine came out with a cover story that an economic textbook is melting away what's wrong with economics economics and in the in the editorial they wrote it is not an economic crisis it is economics in crisis so from that time onwards we have not got away from economics in crisis we continue to adopt to the same principles the same laws the same theories the same assumptions and unless we know what are the newton's falling apple facts i will give three distinct facts the prime minister spoke the prime minister said the motto for g20 one earth one family one future it looks so abstract what is the connection between the three one earth one family one future you know behind this is the three two subdivided into three newtonian falling apple facts which i am going to mention to you you look at india it is it occupies 2.4% of the global land area it has 18% of global population it has 30% of world's animal population it has 8% of world's mammals and uh, uh, birds how is it that this entire thing the entire living organism including the human beings are being sustained on a land area of 2.4% and the entire world is divided into between sea and uh, and the earth and the open space as to 71% and 20, uh, 29% out of 10% is the agricultural land out of which india has 1% one tenth of the world's agricultural land we have and of the 10% agricultural land 75% is used for meat farming only 2.5 less than 2.5% 2.4% is actually used for crop farming and how india sustained it's you know you have to study the history of how it sustained in 1960s in 1970s when we did not have food even then the cattle population kept rising nobody ate cattle our meat consumption today is 3.1 kg per capita per annum it was 5.1 in 2001 it is coming down if you look at the meat consumption of america it is 124 kg per head per annum and now you look at how india is sustaining itself if you look at how much calorie value grain gives 83% of the calorie value is drawn from grains only 19 17% from meat then you look at protein 63% of the protein value comes from grains and only 37% from meat and if you look at that is the ratio is 15 times the calorie value 
of meat you get in uh, grains and seven times six times the uh, protein value you get in uh, grains meat value you get in protein uh, in, in grains and now you look at the damage that meat does to environment it is 10 to 100 times the damage that grain farming does that the meat farming does and because of this we are not able to only feed ourselves we are able to, are able to feed the entire cattle population the bovine population is 30 percent and all this we are feeding do you mean to say it has happened by accident was there not great minds which worked which made our people feel that you have to focus on grain farming you have to eat this you have you have you should not eat this it is not that we forbade non vegetarian food but we made non vegetarian food eaters observe discipline that you can't eat on this day you can for us non vegetarian is a sabji and this whole food culture if that is discarded and we adopt the american way of eating let's assume we will need six times the agricultural land we have. If the world adopts American way of eating food, it will need 40% more land than it has. These are all Newtonian falling apple facts which neither the schools nor the colleges or the public discourse or the government policy or the media do not highlight. Imagine India shifts to another way of eating. Now they say you have every right to eat whatever you want to eat. Yes, if 20% of Indians eat like Americans, your agricultural land will not accommodate you. Do you know that? Can you tell the world? Can you say this is the amount of CO2 gas emission we are preventing by being grain eaters? This is the amount of CO2. You know, CO2 gas emission cannot be absorbed by the atmosphere. It's a permanent damage. This is Newtonian. I'm, I'm short summarizing the whole thing. Second thing is you take housing. In India, the average number of persons living in a house is 4.9. In America, it is 2.5. America had 3.1 persons per household in 1950. Today it has 2.5 persons per household. This reduction of 0.6 person per household meant construction of 35 million more houses and the cost was 8.5 trillion. I am not getting into the environment damage and other damage it caused because that study has been independently done by European Union that every additional house how much environment damage it does, I'm not getting into it. I'm actually getting into the financial stress it causes. If the average number of persons living in India comes down from 4.9 to 2.5, we will need 135 million more houses. We have no space. We have no money. But do you mean to understand this living together, respect of parents, elders, the relation-based life, the idea of sharing space. Do you mean to say all this happened by accident? This happened by a great scheme which was devised by great rishis, saints, seers, retailed through thousands and thousands of mechanisms in local languages. This is an abstract structure which produced concrete results. Then the third thing is this idea of social security. You know, many economists have gone into this issue in the year 1980. The American, uh, the Bureau of Economic, uh, uh, National Bureau of Economic Research brought together several economists and made them discuss this issue. When Milton Friedman, one of the top economists, he said, don't interfere in the intergenerational obligations of uh, the children to the parents and don't bring the government into it. That is precisely what America did. 
They said, you need not have to take care of the parents. You pay 12.5% social security tax. We will take care of it. And huge monies were coming into the social security system because of the baby boomers America. But now population has stabilized and it is even declining. With the result, the contributors, contributions have gone down and withdrawals have gone up. In 2006, it became negative. Today, they say the deficit in the social security system in the future social security obligations are to be taken care of. The present deficit, present value of the future deficit is $63 trillion. There is no answer to it. You cannot rebuild families to privatize social security. Social security can be privatized only through families, relations, culture, intergenerational obligations. You can destroy them. You cannot rebuild them. Let's assume in America, all the earning Indians decide to disown their responsibilities to the parents and say we are willing to contribute this much of tax to Narendra Modi. 600 million people will be at the doors of Narendra Modi. Can India survive? These are all Newtonian falling apple facts. We discuss economics in terms of structures, in terms of buildings, in terms of bridges. But this is real. So, there is a huge obligation on us. When we are talking about India's contribution to the world, this is the contribution. There is an alternative living model. There is no question of human rights overriding social so, the culture. The word diversity entered in the United Nations Dictionary, you will be surprised to know. Only in the year 2001, the cultural diversity convention. We said if there is a conflict between culture and human rights, human rights will prevail. Should be the other way about. Who can articulate this better than presenting the Indian model itself, which is able to balance culture and human rights. So we have a huge job to do. We need to reorient ourselves to reorient the world because for the first time an opportunity has come for India to present its case, its ideas, its model to the world which is Westland and which is having a dead end today. And so my appeal is that let us begin thinking like what Aurobindo was asked to do by Kulachami. Thank you very much.